these are Americans. More than 190 million of them. A people whose story is one of movement and change. A record of migration that is unique in history. and creeds, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. Immigrants were entering the country at the rate of a million a year. Of these latecomers, many lacked the means to make their way beyond the ports of arrival. Crowded in the cities of the coast, Suspended between the past and the future, bewildered, they found it difficult to accept the shifting forms they were expected to follow. Jews and Catholics both arrived on the scene at around the same time, largely as a result of the huge amount of migration that took place over the last part of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. They both arrived at the time when the Protestant ruling class had simply lost its nerve. Uh, it had lost its ability to determine culture. You can see something like an artifact like uh, the Great Gatsby as an example of this. Uh, Tom Buchanan is talking about, you know, those people are taken over. You've got to read Stoddard's book about race and this type of stuff. And you have the Gatsby the Jew and uh, the narrator, or Fitzgerald himself as the Catholic, both looking to the wasp as the kind of paradigm to emulate at a time when the wasp himself is not really sure of this anymore. A lot of what I'm saying here is taken from a book uh, recently uh, published, Andrew R. Heinze, Jews and the American Soul, Human Nature in the 20th Century, Princeton University Press, 2004. Heinz says in his book that psychology provided a perfect focal point for a culture clash between Jews and Catholics as they moved from the periphery toward the center of a society traditionally dominated by Protestants. For many Jews, psychology and Freud represented a path toward a more sophisticated cosmopolitan America. For many Catholics, Freud signified a heretical departure from fundamental religious values. Now, in his book, the culmination of this conflict comes with Archbishop Sheen and Claire Booth Luce after World War II. Archbishop Sheen was a huge presence in 1950s America. He had a show, a television show, where he went toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with uh, Milton Berle and beat him in the ratings all the time. He was having a huge effect on the culture. Large numbers of Americans were converting to Catholicism at this point. It was a huge uh, cultural battle, and by the 50s, the mid-50s, it focused on Sigmund Freud. Sheen gave a sermon at St. Patrick's at which he talked about Freud and the confessional, and basically talked about psychoanalysis as a secularized version of the confessional. It caused a huge stir. There was a, a, an article in the American Scholar which accused both uh, Fulton Sheen and Claire Booth Luce of being anti-Semites because they don't like Sigmund Freud. Now this is a state-of-the-art uh, battle here that's going on here. What we're talking about here is a takeover, a redefinite, just as Fish and Derrida uh, decades later would engage in a redefinition of discourse, the Jews at this point were engaging largely by the use, through the use of Sigmund Freud in a redefinition of the soul. Now, I mean, I mean this in a, in a perfectly literal sense. Uh, we're talking about psuche, the Greek word for soul, and so therefore we're talking about psychology, which is the science of the soul. Now, this is classic psychology. Okay, this is Greek. And in Greek, it goes all the way back to people like Euripides and Plato. The classic definition of the soul, or the image of the soul, was the rider on a horse. <laughs> 
the rider was reason, the horse was passion, and in many ways the bridle was the will. And so you had the tripartite soul, reason, will, passion, logos, ethos, pathos. And that was the, that was the right rule, reason ruled passion the way the rider rode a horse. What happened over the course of the 20th century is that that was inverted. In other words, we had a revolution in psychology that paralleled the later revolution in, in uh, hermeneutical thought. What you had to do was, in effect, redefine the soul so that it, did, it lost all of its, uh, what should I say, Christian characteristics, even though this is, it's only Christian in the minds of the Jews that wanted to subvert it. This is not Christian. This is not a Christian soul. It's the Greek soul. It was adopted by Aquinas and by the Catholic Church, but it's basically a Greek idea. This is what uh, Heinze says about this period of time. G. Stanley Hall had a classic work, and it was known as Adolescence, published in 1904. According to Heinze, Paul's work was, quote, saturated in Christian reference. At this point, what happened was a war, a war like the literary critical wars, but this became a psychological, a war over who was going to determine what the soul was. Uh, the leader in this war at this particular time was a, an anthropologist by the name of Franz Boas, a Jew, whose assistant was going to be sort of the leading soldier, the sort of the frontal assault on Hall's book, and her name was Margaret Mead. Franz Boas was an uh, intellectual of Jewish extraction. He came from Germany. He became very important in the early 20th century. And the reason he was important was because he was the father of a school of anthropology that uh, essentially said that race was not important in explaining any differences between any groups of people. His descendants have been people who have pathologized any reference, to any concept of race, racial differences, and so on. This is uh, sort of a pillar of the intellectual left in the 20th century. And he's important because he founded this school. They became the heads of the departments of very important universities. So that by the mid-1920s, his students basically dominated the American Anthropological Association. They had a very clear ethnic political agenda, at least for the Jews among them. In other words, Franz Boas was not just a, a sort of in, uh, intellectual pursuing truth or something like that. He well recognized that he was had a very strong Jewish identity, the one of his main... Um, goals in life, one of his main purposes uh, was to uh, was to promote a this intellectual perspective which he thought would be important for combating anti-Semitism. He had the sort of rise of racial anti-Semitism culminating in the National Socialist Movement in Germany. He viewed his ideology as combating that. He was also associated with far-left political organizations. And that's been typical, I think, of his disciples as you go down. He died in the late 1930s, but then his disciples effectively dominated anthropology down in the present. It was, it's classically portrayed as the nature versus nurture battle. In other words, uh, the issue was environment or race at this point. And Boas and these people had decided that the important thing was environment, and they had to defeat the racist. One of his big ideas was that he couldn't make generalizations about culture. He couldn't develop a theory, a universal theory of culture, uh, because each culture was, you know, incredibly unique, sort of beyond the pale of, of scientific generalizations. And prior to him, there, there was a sort of robust uh, evolutionary theory of culture that, where you had these various grades of culture, beginning with hunter-gatherers, the chiefdoms, you know, nation state societies and so on. And th the problem he had with that was that the people who were doing this viewed European culture as a pinnacle. And uh, th uh, that to him uh, was anathema. He, he was strongly identified Jew. He viewed the Prussian culture of his childhood as uh, very dangerous. Uh, it just uh, he had very negative, um, you know, memories of that, very negative attitudes about that culture. And I think that's, you know, that's sort of the, common denominator, I think, of all these Jewish intellectual movements that we'll talk about.
is this this underlying you know hostility, distrust, this deep historical memory of uh, of the negative things that have happened to Jews in European culture. So when he thinks of uh, the Prussian culture of Germany, he doesn't think of cathedrals and kings and, and leaders. He thinks of th that there were elements of anti-Semitism there, that uh, it was a Christian culture, that Christians have oppressed Jews over the centuries. So for him, these, these cultures were not the pinnacle of civilization. They, were not, they weren't the pinnacle of science or anything. And so as an attempt to deconstruct culture, this is the origin of the sort of cultural relativist movement, you know, that all cultures are sort of equal. There's no way to grade them in terms of even of their technical accomplishments or anything. And he, had a, he had famous disciples, Margaret Mead. She was the person who, uh, under Boas's direction, went to Samoa, did a study of the natives in Samoa, and came back and said that basically, Sturm und Drang, a storm and stress, they got it from Schiller, uh, but since psychology was German, they were using terms like this, Storm and Drang during adolescence is only a cultural phenomenon. It's only in America. It's all the result of Christianity. If we eliminate all these Christian sexual prohibitions, there will be no stress in society. And as proof of that, look at the people in Samoa. Well, the fact of the matter is that it became apparent after the publication of uh, Derek Freeman's book, Margaret Mead in Samoa, an Australian anthropologist, it became apparent that she, Margaret Mead made it all up. It was one of the biggest instances of academic fraud in the 20th century. She didn't speak Samoan. Freeman says she was just uh, put on by Samoan girls who would giggle and tell jokes and make fun of the round eye or whatever they call these uh, white people in Samoa. And she overlooked uh, a significant part of Samoan culture, which was basically a digital rape, was part of Samoan culture didn't get mentioned at all. There were also, you know, if the Samoan man sits under a palm tree with his, uh, the guy's sister, the guy beats up the guy. You can't do that with my sister. And so on and so forth. In other words, it was made up. It was what we would call a Blue Lagoon anthropology. Based on, you know, the Blue Lagoon movie with Brooke Shields. It's basically, it's like Lord, the plot of Lord of the Flies. The plane is flying. It crashes on this tropical island in the Pacific, and suddenly, hey, all bets are off. Because all of that stuff you believe was the moral law, that's all bourgeois morality. There's no bourgeoisie here. So morality doesn't have any force anymore, and we can all live like uh, you know, free and wonderful people. The French had this fantasy. Rousseau was probably the main proponent of it with his idea of the noble savage. And now it caught on in America as a way of undermining the whole idea that there was a Christian morality that should be normative for this country. So it was a mythology, but it was a very effective mythology. Margaret Mead uh, essentially created a mythical anthropology that was accepted as gospel. Again, her writings aren't very important, except for the fact that they were promoted and became intellectual gospel. To the point that even after she was debunked and was shown to be a myth, shown to be false, shown to be either lies or, or um, misinformation, that she is still INAs. And people were horrified that she was, her reputation would be called into question. So it's, it's a very powerful thing that anybody who disagrees with all this is up against. It, it's got a huge inertia at this point. It's very hard to change. These things take on a life of their own. They're, they're, it's a matter of promotion. It's, it's not a matter of truth or reality. It's a matter of leading a movement that has an influence. And so the, the influence comes not so much from the original person, but from the infrastructure, the publishing houses, the media, the professors in universities who assign Margaret Mead as part of their courses. You know, this is where it achieves a life of its own, and it is seen as true, it is seen as science, it is seen as inviolably correct. And I think the concept of race is very respectable. Uh, but still, the, the concept of race is, is profoundly controversial. So this is the legacy of that, and we still see that in the present. Because people like, like Philippe Rushton at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, Richard Lynn, their analyses of racial differences in intelligence in different peoples of the world is the exact sort of thing that is anathema to the, the Boasian school. And um, that continues with us today, because the writings of people like... Uh, 
brushed in the land are marginalized. They're not talked about. If they're ever mentioned in the newspapers, they, they tend to be qualified. You'll bring in all these other people who say that's nonsense. You can't even get uh, the concept of intelligence doesn't make any sense. Uh, there is no such thing as race, etc. You know, so it, it remains problematic to this day. The transformation of the universities in the United States in the direction of political correctness, a lot of that has to be laid at the foot of Franz Boas. Sigmund Freud is the most famous psychologist of the 20th century. Like Franz Boas, he started a school of psychology. Like Franz Boas, he viewed anti-Semitism as an enormous problem. He himself was subjected to anti-Semitism when he was young, as was Franz Boas. And this stayed with him. This was an important part of their psyche, and you can see this in their writings, that they, they viewed uh, the eradication of anti-Semitism as a very important criterion uh, for a good theory, basically. So at a deep level, psychoanalysis was about developing a theory that could be used to oppose anti-Semitism. Freud consciously viewed himself as someone who was combating Western culture. He viewed himself as a sort of Semitic general fighting Rome. There's some very striking passages in his letters. He identified with Hannibal, who was a Semitic general fighting against Rome. In Jewish thought, Rome is often viewed as the quintessential West. And when they think of Rome, they think of Rome destroying the Second Temple, that uh, Rome fundamentally as this sort of evil Western power. And Freud viewed himself as psychoanalysis was a mechanism of cultural warfare, as it were. Psychoanalysis was sort of flagrantly unscientific. I mean, they didn't even make the pretense of doing a good study of anything. At the time, you know, in the early 20th century, the, the dominant school in psychology in America and, and England was behaviorism. You know, and behaviorism, even though I, I'm, I'm not a behaviorist at all, what you have to say about the behaviorists is that they had a strong sense that psychology had to be based on experimentation. You had to have control groups. You had to have well-validated observations and instruments. This was completely foreign to psychoanalysis. So, uh, you know, Psychoanalysis, even though it made a huge impact on the culture, even though it dominated departments of psychiatry, it did not dominate departments of psychology to, any, uh, to anywhere near that extent. And that's because departments of psychology in America and England had the strong empirical sense. And so they criticized psychoanalysis. They went, where's your data? Where, show me some studies. Even some of Freud's followers very early on uh, became disillusioned with it. They, they didn't see the data. Uh, they started to realize that, these, that psychoanalysis is basically a set of propositions that were being promulgated by leaders. And, uh, and if you were a follower, you would simply accept these. If you did not accept them, you were simply written out of the movement. So it was not conducted as a normal science. And that, you know, that produced uh, skepticism among behaviorists and other American psychologists uh, so that it never got that, that extent of domination in psychology. Where it really was, it was important and really dominated was in the area of psychiatry. Psychiatry became dominated by the Freudians, but that has disappeared because of the rise of biological psychiatry. I mean, nowadays, when psychiatrists think of depression, they're much more likely to think about what drugs you can use, uh, what parts of the brain are involved in depression. Of course, we didn't have that back in the early 20th century. And so psychoanalysts could say anything they wanted about depression or neurosis. They could make up stories about repressing sex or uh, whatever story they wanted. And uh, that was uh, pretty much accepted. And then you'd bring patients who had neuroses in, and you'd talk to them, and um, hopefully they got better. Maybe they didn't. Uh, mostly they didn't. A kind of quack from Berlin invited Freud to come to uh, Berlin and visit with him. And Freud wrote back and said, I'd like to come, but I'm afraid my patients will get well in my absence. This gives you some indication of the predatory attitude that Freud had toward his patients. He had a cartoon that he used to keep in his office, uh, a lion, and under the lion it says, schon zwölf Uhr Mittag und keiner Neger. It's already noon and no Negroes. In other words, I'm hungry, I need a Negro to come in here, I need to eat the Negro. Well, who, what's the Negro? Well, that's the patient. 
And so the best example would be uh, Horace Frink, this uh, doctor from America. He wants to be a psychoanalyst, so he shows up with Freud, and during the course of his psychoanalysis with Freud, he says, uh, I have this sexual attraction toward my patients. Isn't this bad? I mean, isn't it bad if you screw one of your patients? Isn't that unethical? Uh, 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 not to say even beyond the fact that you're married to someone else. Well, what does Freud say? Well, no, he didn't think it was a bad idea. As a matter of fact, he urged Frank to dump his wife and marry this woman because she had a lot of money and then give a significant contribution to the psychoanalytic society. I mean, this is, this is outrageous. This is an outrageous conflict of interest, an outrageous abuse of the whole idea of medicine, and certainly an abuse of what uh, psychiatry is. And Freud himself was involved in it. This isn't an abuse. This is the heart of the matter, because psychoanalysis is a form of sexual liberation as political control. I think the genius of Freud was to develop a sort of metaphor or sort of paradigm that people resonated to automatically because you know obviously uh, the uh, the repression of sexuality sort of was p an important part of Western culture if, if I was just struck watching the movie Kinsey which is about Kinsey the, the sexual reformer now, he was not really a Freudian but you could see that repression of sexuality that was so typical a part of the culture in which he grew up in uh, where you were you know, concerned about, you know, if masturbation was a sin. You know, and I remember growing up in the 1950s uh, in a religious environment, you know, being feeling guilty about, you know, any kind of impure thoughts about women's uh, sexuality, much less doing things. Uh, so th that was part of our culture. And I think people, um, obviously, some people uh, did not, it did not fit well with them. Uh, they they uh, saw that as inhibiting their natural desires and so on. So it became a, a sort of rallying point, I think, for the intellectual left. People like Kinsey were sort of certainly greeted by psychoanalysts. And you could see him having problems with his religious environment. His father was a preacher. His father viewed, you know, sex as, as evil, and essentially. And that was part of the zeitgeist at the time. So when Freud you know, talked about sex as the fundamental basis of all things neurotic, it had a certain surface plausibility. It wasn't ridiculous, uh, I suppose. Uh, it wasn't based on science, but it was based, I think, uh, on a sort of uh, attractive paradigm. And Sigmund Freud became the learned Jew uh, when it came to the doctor. In other words, you got a problem, go to the doctor. The doctor has science, the scientist will cure you. Well, you know, that was sort of the myth that got promoted about Sigmund Freud uh, after the fact, around the same time that uh, the Margaret Mead fraud is coming to light. It turns out that that's not exactly what Sigmund Freud was doing. One of the things I've noticed uh, with uh, Jewish intellectual movements is they tend to be centered around a sort of charismatic leader. Certainly Boas was that way. Freud was that way to the max. I mean, he, he was the quintessential guru with devoted disciples who were centered around him. Uh, they developed uh, the, the associations of the psychoanalysis were very highly organized, top-down uh, societies. Uh, ex people who dissented from these doctrines were excluded. So it was not really scientific in, in the normal sense. We think of a science as uh, open to, to new ideas, uh, that you, you could have a study that would disprove something like the Oedipal complex or something like that. That would be perfectly normal in, in a real science. In psychoanalysis, anybody who disagreed with, with the Oedipal complex was simply expelled. And usually they would be expelled with saying they had psychopathology. Um, so it was not conducted as a normal science. There were a, a sort of central organization. Uh, people who dissented were expelled. Uh, people who were on board were admitted, and um, but they, they there was a sort of pecking order. The, if you were uh, close to Sigmund Freud, if you had, had personal uh, relationship with him, if you had been psychoanalyzed by Freud, that meant you were very close to the top. Uh, and so um, leadership in the society depended pretty much on how closely you were associated with Freud.
uh, which of course is very much unlike a, a real science. A real science, uh, the personalities of the scientists are really not important. It's what they have done. Uh, their ideas are open to refutation. You can change them. You can bring new data. That's the normal practice of science. Psychoanalysis never operated that way. There were a set of core doctrines. It was like a religion, you know, literally like a religion, or like a sort of political view like communism or something like that, where you had to accept certain things. And if you didn't, you, well, you just weren't part of the group anymore. It's portrayed as medicine because of the influence that the people who want to promote this have over modern culture. Okay, and so you have all sorts of people now disciples of the new psychology. One of them is a uh, man by the name of uh, Yastrov, who ends up at the University of Wisconsin. This is Heinz's description of what Yastrov was doing at the University of Wisconsin. Yastrov targeted Christianity in a way that Pierce did not, as the prime example of the forcible imposition of thought on a community of people. In his course at Wisconsin on the psychology of belief and in his popular writings, he spoke of, quote, the sad page of history that records the church's techniques of censorship and suppression of thought. He also used the biblical and rabbinical phraseology of the remnant of Israel when he referred to the dissident few who fight in all times and places for freedom of thought. There will always be a saving remnant, he wrote, who are willing to give up dogma. Well, wait a minute. I thought you were in medicine. I thought you were doing medicine here. Well, what you're seeing here is that deviance has been redefined. It will be redefined over the course of the century. And what used to be uh, a sin is now a virtue. For example, homosexuality. What used to be an aberration is now normal. And what used to be normal Namely, let's say the revulsion at homosexuality is now a thought crime under the regime of political correctness. So a student at Temple University, my alma mater, who objects to the production of Corpus Christi by the university, was dragged out and taken to the psychiatric clinic at Temple University Hospital for objecting to a blasphemous homosexual propaganda play. Well, this is the essence of political correctness, and it's the essence of what happened during the course of the 20th century. Deviance was redefined as its opposite. Deviance is binary. Deviance is prohibition. There is never going to be a world without deviance. What you have here is the umwertung aller Werte, the transvaluation of values where what was good is now bad and what was good is now wicked. This happens in the realm of psychology largely through the efforts of people like Freud. So you see this as a way of cultural subversion. Freud became the vehicle for cultural subversion and was interested in, in those particular terms. The Frankfurt School started in the 1920s in Germany. It was composed entirely of a group of Jewish intellectuals associated with the University of Frankfurt in Germany. They were certainly part of the intellectual left and seen that way in Germany. When Hitler came to power, he dissolved them. They came to the United States, most of them, and they pursued their studies in the United States. Now, when they came to the United States, they were confronted with a sort of empirical culture that was not so typical of Germany. Germany was more still in this sort of philosophical era. The intellectual life would have been dominated by people like Marx and Hegel and that sort of philosophical idealism or materialism in the case of Marx. And that, those were the, where the debates were. Because the, the English tradition, uh, you can see in American sociology, was much more empirical. You go out and you get numbers. So when they came to America, they really had a need to develop an empirical study. And so they became much more empirically oriented. And so, but their philosophical ideas were developed when they were still in Germany. They were very much informed by their political attitudes. And these people, as I say, were, they were all Jews. They were deeply identified, strongly identified Jews. And once again, they were fundamentally concerned with anti-Semitism as a problem. And so they viewed their philosophy, and it really was a philosophy before it became an empirical study. It was a philosophy of anti-Semitism. And in that philosophy, they really used 
uh, fundamental psychoanalytic concepts. And so they have the idea that anti-Semitism fundamentally, com fundamentally comes from repressing nature. I mean, that, that's about as psychoanalytic as you can get. By repressing nature, you develop hatred to the Jews, and they even use you know, ideas like projection, which is very much of a psychoanalytic idea. In other words, Jew, uh, the idea would be that um, a non-Jew would uh, have a problem, say, in his economic uh, livelihood or something like that, or he would w want power for his own group. Well, he would, uh, that, that is sort of morally questionable, and so he'd repress that and project that onto the Jews. So the Jews would be seen as lusting after power. Uh, and as oppressing Gentiles, when in fact, uh, according to this theory, it was the, the Gentiles themselves who wanted power. And it was these you know, wealthy Gentiles who would get these people to think that it was the Jews who were the problem when really they were oppressing the Jews and they were also oppressing you know, the poor classes of non-Jews. So this was a, a theory, it was not based on any data. Once again, it was based on a sort of combination of Marxism and psychoanalysis. Um, no empirical data for this, but when they came to America, they, they you know they couldn't just sell this as a philosophy, because in America you really had to get some data. Uh, psychoanalysis has managed to get by for decades without this, but I think the Fr the Frankfurt School felt the need to sort of uh, get some kind of verification. So what they did when they got to this country was they started with the authoritarian personality studies, and again they got at the very elite universities. They're associated with Columbia University. University of California at Berkeley, and they came up with these questionnaires and so on, uh, essentially designed to, to tap people's attitudes about Jews uh, and uh, try to show that, that these were a sign of pathology. So essentially what they did, uh, they, they uh, tried to show that people, in the end, uh, with healthy family relationships, people who looked up to their mothers and fathers, people who had a strong religious orientation, um, that these people tended to have negative views about Jews and that essentially these negative views about Jews were a result of repression within the family, that they had hostility towards their parents, even though there's absolutely no evidence of this in any of the records that they had. They interpreted uh, positive feelings for parents as sort of sublimations of hostility because in the records, the, the people who had strong family relationships, had sort of fam strong attitudes about their in-group or their family, their nation, their race. These people tended to, to think, uh, to have more negative views about Jews because after all, Jews were an out-group. Um, they, uh, they, they interpreted these positive attitudes about their family as, you know, repressions of hostility towards their parents. And conversely, when they found uh, sort of surface feelings of anxiety about their parents, they interpreted those as signs of deep affection. And so the people that they were idealizing had sort of anxieties about whether their parents loved them. They had ambivalences about their sexual uh, identity and so on. Um, these are the people that the Frankfurt School were, were promulgating as the ideal liberal personality. The major obstacle was the family. The nuclear family, uh, with the father in the lead role, was extremely dangerous. Frankfurt School saw it as a repressive structure. So the nuclear family, w with uh, a, a certain amount of restraint that's necessary for a family to function, w w was the place that uh, people learned uh, to be repressed. And they, they got conditioned to following orders. And this made them uh, into what uh, a later writer, Adorno, would spin into a book called the, the Authoritarian Personality. And the Authoritarian Personality was very bad. Uh, it, it conditioned us for a society where we would follow orders, hence you know, patriotism. So when the Kaiser called, Germans rallied to the cause. When the President of the United States called, or the Prime Minister of Britain, or the President of France, people, because of the nuclear family, were conditioned to respond to the father figure. Anyway, uh, uh, that all is really pretty simplistic, but th that's what they said. So it became very, very important to undermine the family. When I was a student at Johns Hopkins, I can recall in sociology and political science class, they did nothing but talk about this book published in 1950, The Authoritarian Personality. But you know, they talked about it, they analyzed it, they criticized it, they talked about the methodologies and this and that. We actually had, there was a subject on my exams. But you know, the weird thing was, they never assigned the book for us to read. 
<laughs> and of course, it's only much later, you see, uh, when I was browsing a used bookstore that I discovered the reason why they never assigned the book. Lo and behold, right here on the introductory page, The Authoritarian Personality, copyright 1950 by the American Jewish Committee. This is ethnic politics. This isn't science. This is unbelievable. And, and so many of the problems now facing white Gentiles, which they may or may not, may not feel yet, arise out of this study and the prejudices, the bigoted positions that are set forth very candidly right in the introduction to the study. Let me read you a short passage which will illustrate the point. The present inquiry into the nature of the potentially fascistic individual began with anti-Semitism in the focus of attention. My, what a surprise, <laughs> given who's sponsoring the study. The authors in common with most social scientists hold the view that anti-Semitism is based largely upon factors in the subject, that is to say in the anti-Semite, <laughs> and in his total situation, whatever that means, then upon actual characteristics, behavior, or power of Jews. Now that's really interesting. <laughs> that is to say, <laughs> the study of anti-Semitism is isolated in this project to characteristics of individuals they identify as authoritarian personalities. It never examines the relationship between that individual's interests and the practical and enormous exercise of Jewish power you see within the political system. It never examines the consequences and impact of Jewish power upon that individual and his reaction to it, you see? Because then the whole subject becomes much more nuanced and frankly far less prejudiced and far less bigoted. Uh, and, and, and here's another classic statement in the introduction to the authoritarian personality where they are discussing the methodology of all the studies in this thick tome. And they say here, <laughs> groups in which there was a preponderance of minority group members were avoided in the study. And when minority group members happened to belong to an organization which participated, pardon me, which cooperated in the study, their questionnaires were excluded from the calculations. What they're saying there is that, you see, prejudice and racism are uniquely white characteristics. This isn't science at all. It's simply ethnic warfare, and it is such blatant and obvious ethnic warfare, this book and everything it spawned. The authoritarian personality did become very influential, and it, it certainly does have uh, some data in it. It's not, you know, they, they, they were successful, you know, in um, impressing, I think, a lot of people. But even, even early on, when it first came out, there were, there were critics who looked at it and said, look, there's some, some weird stuff going on here. The, the reality was that they used psychoanalysis as a way of basically getting any, anything they wanted out of this stuff. So there was some deception going on. I tried to, you know, I took special pains to show how, how counterintuitive these interpretations are, how lacking in scientific rigor. They have uh, embarked upon uh, the promotion of a policy that, that is to deconstruct, or that is to tear down the major uh, foundations of Western society. The, the loyalty to the nuclear family, uh, loyalty to religion, to God, and, uh, and uh, loyalty to country. And, and in pursuit of doing that, uh, they play fast and loose with the facts. It's the, for them, it's the thought or the ide ideology that counts, not the empiric uh, justif uh, justification for, for conclusions. The Frankfurt School, at its base, developed the ideology that you had to sort of reject your family by rejecting your family, you would then uh, be more likely to uh, accept, or you would be less likely to be anti-Jewish. And so, you know, it's a remarkable thing because they never supposed that Jewish children should reject their parents. If you're going to promulgate Judaism to the next generation, you have to have children who identify with their parents. But in the authoritarian personality, identifying with your parents, 
who were Christian especially, was the epitome of pathology. This had to be eradicated. But you see what the, what the authoritarian personality is, holding out individualism, radical individualism, as a cultural ideal. Now, of course, individualism is a long roots in, in European society. But what you're talking about with radical individualism is giving up all your allegiances. You just become the isolated individual. This is not a prescription that Jews have ever adopted. I mean, if there's anything that is characteristic of Judaism, it's a strong sense of identification with a group. So essentially, this is a prescription for the behavior of, of Gentiles that would uh, essentially make them less likely to have allegiances with other groups. Because what, from the standpoint of Jews, what is the the most terrifying thing is a, a group of non-Jews united by an ideology where they have a strong sense of group membership and which Jews are viewed negatively. I mean, the paradigm of that would be, of course, National Socialism in Germany from 1933 to 1945. Fundamentally, what Nazism was about was having a strong sense of being a member of a nation, having a strong sense that you're part of an in-group, and these other people uh, are not, you know, you're, you're not on their page, uh, Jews especially. And so uh, one way to get rid of that basically is to advocate individuals for everybody. Get rid of your allegiances. Don't have any allegiance to religion, country, race, even family. And again, one of the, the points I keep making there is that this is completely hypocritical because to be a strong identified Jew means that you are highly connected to a group, that you have a strong sense of group membership, that you think of out groups as potentially threatening, as enemies, and so on. In other words, the psychological processes of a group membership tend to make us view negatively the people in other groups, and, and that applies to Jews as well as anybody else. So strong identified Jews tend to have strongly positive views of their in-group, strongly negative views of the outsiders. And, you know, that's part of the cultural critique of these Jewish intellectuals have very negative views about the culture and peoples of the outside them. One of the questions about the spread of the Frankfurt School of Ideology in the United States, and especially in universities, is how they jumped so quickly from being a handful of people in key universities to dominating the university system. It was their presence throughout the system. While Boazian anthropology was spread by a careful process of the development of cadres and placing them in key positions over the course of a generation, the Frankfurt School very quickly came to ascendancy all across American higher education. And this has always remained kind of a mystery, but I think part of the mystery is explained by the role of the New School for Social Research and its agenda, which was to credential Jewish refugees from Europe before, during, and after World War II. These people were credentialed in a very pro forma manner. Very few of them did any, anything like what we would consider coursework. They were simply given advanced degrees. They turned out torrents of PhDs, and moreover, this was part of a broader stream of European Jews, many with phony credentials, coming into the United States at the very moment of the largest expansion of the American university system in its history, which was during the GI Bill after World War II. Suddenly, there was a need for thousands of new professors. And these could not be conservatives, because they were still politically risky after World War II. But Jews were considered to be morally pure because of their terrible suffering, and their credentials were never looked at too closely. Suddenly there were thousands, tens of thousands of new professors, and they all held this ideology, which was an ideology that was based on advancing their own interests. It was very influential in the academic community, and it spawned a whole lot of secondary literature, you might say. Again, uh, the authoritarian personality was funded by the American Jewish Committee, and you, there was a whole spate of books uh, funded by the American Jewish Committee or the Anti-Defamation League. The whole point of these uh, books was pretty much the same as the authoritarian personality. The idea is that majorities uh, must tolerate minorities. They should not be concerned about their own eclipse. That if they are, if you are any kind of psychological anxiety that a majority might feel, that they are going to become a minority, and what 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 that might mean for a majority is viewed as you know just a psychopathology. It's a medical health problem. We have to try to get rid of it. White Americans basically should accept this, and and if they don't, then there's something wrong with you. One place Boazian ideology and the Frankfurt School come together is in their agreement that majorities can have no rights. This arises from the notion that there are no true majorities. 
So, for example, while Jews may form a cohesive, solid, and long-lasting minority group, the ideas of cultural relativism and of the Frankfurt School act to disintegrate majorities. So, for example, there is no 65% white majority in the United States. There may be a few percent of Irish, a few percent of German, a few percent of this, a few percent of that. The kinds of differences that are created among the majority disintegrated in both of these ideologies. So while they are immune from these kinds of atomization ideologies and practices, they impose these on the majorities. So it's meaningful to speak of the French people and exclude the French. It's meaningful to speak of the British people while excluding the Scots, Irish, Welsh, and English. We see this at every institutional level. So, for example, in law schools, there are interest groups and student organizations for every imaginable ethnicity, except for the majority. Majority students simply don't exist. Now, a white man can be gay, he can be a transsexual, and then he becomes a minority. He is higher quality as a result of being made into a minority. A white woman can become a feminist, and so she can be a member of a minority. So piece by piece, the majority is simply dismantled. This is the basis of the idea that majorities cannot exist. If a majority exists in the thinking of the Frankfurt School and in the thinking of the Boazians, it is simply not dismantled yet. And yet minority groups, by definition, are supposed to be immune from this, although in practice, only one minority is immune from this process of disintegration. Again, uh, I make the point at one point, you know, that this is never uh, thought about as an ideology, say, in Israel, where you have a very clear ideology, this is a Jewish state, it's going to remain a Jewish state, it has a moral right to remain a Jewish state, and so on. But the rights of white America is to, to keep America as a white country with a white majority, you know, with, where white ethnic uh, interests would be safeguarded is completely rejected in this literature. I think that is the fundamental uh, premise of political correctness. They, they're basically the idea that white people as a majority have no moral legitimacy to any political power. Uh, that, that they don't have any, any moral authority to maintain a majority, to advance their ethnic interests, to think of uh, a certain piece of land as their land uh, essentially, that they would be able to control that and so on. Again, this is, this is an ideology that you see throughout history, that all peoples have, you know, they've basically gotten a hunk of land and they've defended it. This has been the, the, the major, um, you know, story, obviously, in human history, and it's certainly the case with Zionists and Israel. So it's a normal human uh, undertaking. And um, yet, in the, with this literature, uh, the whole thrust of it is to call that into question, to to say that there is no moral legitimacy, that well, that that white Americans um, should simply accept their coming uh, minority status, and uh, anything else is is there's something wrong if you think otherwise. There's something wrong with you. And, of course, the, the implicit idea here is that white people have nothing to fear about a future in which they are a minority, that their political interests, their ethnic interests are met by, giving, by allowing tens of millions of people to come into the, the land that, that they're going to vote, they're going to have their own ideas about what uh, is a proper foreign policy, they're going to have allegiances to the people that they left behind, as Jewish Americans certainly have allegiances to Israel. So um, it's, a, it's a very frightening thing. Uh, I think that one of the things about the Frankfurt School is it was always presented as fundamentally a moral issue and a psychiatric issue. And fundamentally, it's about white guilt. I think the big story of the 20th century is you start out in the 20th century, European peoples have divided up the world. They basically run the world. Uh, they're by far the most powerful, the most economically advanced, the most scientifically advanced. They run the world. Um, and by the end of the 20th century, um, there, there is no moral legitimacy for having any sovereignty anywhere. In other words, European peoples have no, no um, moral right to sovereignty over any piece of land anywhere, even in Europe, traditional Europe. Because you see the same people who are promoting massive immigration and so on into this country 
are promoting immigration to Europe and other areas. And increasingly in Europe, uh, you're getting the these ideas that uh, that there's no such thing as a nation based on a certain ethnic group um, that is defending their interests and their territory. Instead, uh, there's a sort of the the idea of a nation is simply a proposition, a certain uh, moral set of values and rights and so on. And that's fundamentally what the Frankfurt School is promulgating, especially in the in the wake of the Frankfurt School. People like uh, you know Lipset and Rad were basically strongly identified Jewish activists are associated with the ADL and so on. They are writing and basically saying the white Americans have no moral right to have a set of ethnic interests that they are defending. I first made contact with the idea of political correctness in the early 90s when my son became a student at Harvard University. And during this time I was not completely unaware of what was going on in academe because I had been a professor at a college uh, here in town. I sort of knew that there were things that, uh, you know, were not good to say, that things were helped your career, things hurt your career. But uh, this was the first time that I had come across a phrase that actually summarized that whole taboo or that whole sense of speech code, and it was called political correctness. My son's generation were probably more receptive to it than I was, or more sensitive to it than I was, because they were living under this code every day. And so one of the things they did was form an alternative magazine to sort of the reigning hegemony of political ideas on campus. Uh, the magazine was called Peninsula, and in those days we still talked about uh, liberals versus conservative. So all the campuses were run by liberals and so the magazine was going to be conservative in opposition to these liberals. What it, what it was, I think, was more ethnic than that. It was basically Catholics and oftentimes Irish Catholics and oftentimes Irish Catholics from Boston who felt that their values were simply not represented by the uh, ruling class at, at Harvard. One of the main areas of contention at this time was sexuality in particular homosexuality. And so the students at Peninsula put out an issue of their magazine about homosexuality, their protest against homosexuality. I just, I don't remember the title, but I remember the cover page had a, a pink triangle that was sort of smashed into pieces. So here are these guys, they're going to smash the pink triangle. Well, there was a huge, absolute huge reaction to what they did. Uh, to give you some indication of what it was like, the Christian minister on campus, a black man by the name of Gomes, holds a rally, and at this rally, he comes out and announces that he's a homosexual. I mean, it was a classic instance of the guilty flea where none pursueth. Nobody mentioned him by name, but he's going to announce he's a homosexual. Uh, the kids' names were put up on bulletin boards, uh, their phone numbers with instructions to harass them, harass them in the middle of the night. Uh, he graduated that year when we went for the graduation. It's mentioned in the Harvard Crimson. And then, you know, we're standing in Harvard Yard, and there are all these famous people walking by in the procession. There's John Kenneth Galbraith. There's John Updike. These are just the people I mentioned, and they just go by, and nobody's, you know, doing anything. And suddenly this roar comes up from the crowd, and the roar is getting closer and closer, and you think, who is this? I mean, who is this great man that everyone is, is recognizing here? Well, it's Reverend Gomes. And his greatness consists in the fact that he, admit, he was a black man who admitted that he was a homosexual. Okay? Well, I mean, I sort of was attuned to this, so I decided, well, I'll give, my, I'll give a talk. Let's, that's me. I, I was doing research on the whole uh, manipulation of race that took place in this country between the time of the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s and the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. It included people like Jack Kerouac. His book On the Road has this passage where he says he's walking through Denver in twilight wishing I were a Negro. You know, why are you wishing you were a Negro? And then there was, of course, Norman Mailer's essay, The White Negro, which was around 1957, the same year that Kerouac's On the Road came out. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, Norman Mailer was scheduled to speak the same night I'm scheduled to speak at Harvard, and because of the publicity I got from the Black Student Association, I got Norman Mailer's room, and he got my room. He got the little room, I got the big room, uh, because I had put up posters, and the title of my talk was, it was uh, Spade 
Kicks, which I got from Kerouac's novel, uh, Modernity and the uh, Negro as a Paradigm of Sexual Liberation. Well, huge crowd shows up, hostile crowd. Uh, about 200 of the students walked out in the middle of the talk and protest, but that still left three, 400 people there. It was a huge number of people. Uh, so uh, I, I was giving the talk, and I was just going through texts that every professor at Harvard could have gotten out of the library. And one of these was uh, Hannah Tillich's memoir. Uh, Hannah Tillich was the wife of Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich was the Protestant theologian in the period in America after World War II. You couldn't go into a college bookstore in the 60s without seeing a copy of his book, Courage to Be, which were a series of lectures that he gave. He was named by Time magazine as kind of the official theologian of America. And here I am reading his memoir of, from his wife's point of view, and it turns out that he was a sexual degenerate. And not only that, but a kind of racially oriented sexual degenerate as well. He loved to go to places like Small's Paradise in Harlem. There's a passage there where Paul was dancing with a negress, and suddenly everybody's booing. And I stop, and I, I said, well, wait a minute. Why are you booing? I'm reading a book that you can take out of the library here. It's Hannah Tillich's memoir. I'm not, I'm not endorsing this. I'm just reading it. And secondly, you endorsed it because Paul Tillich taught at Harvard. So why are you booing me because I'm telling you uh, what the wife of the guy you hired was really like? What, what's the big deal here? Well, this was sort of... This was not politically correct, but what, what does politically correct mean in this context? It means you can't read books in the library. It means there's this speech code that uh, prohibits, prohibits what? Prohibits what? I mean, I thought that's what we as professors were supposed to do. You know, we're supposed to do research like this. Well, anyway, uh, it was clear that there was a deeper grammar to this discussion and that it wasn't black and it wasn't homosexual, that these were sort of the puppets that were out there dancing. Uh, maybe the deeper grammar had to do with social engineering. In other words, using race to achieve certain ends. Do you know what I mean? That was getting to the point where you're not allowed to talk about the guy behind the screen. Uh, but there was a deeper grammar that needed to be explicated.